Oh, good afternoon everyone. The story of this great discovery actually starts on May the 29th, 1453. Blank looks from everybody. Well, it's my wedding anniversary, but that apart is also the anniversary of the capture of Constantinople by Sultan Mehmet II. And one of the things that's not often realised about the capture of Constantinople is that the impact it had on Europe in the sense of changing things dramatically. The capture of Constantinople gave the Ottoman Empire total control over the trade in silk and spices between the Far East and Europe. Sultan Mehmet II now had complete control over this trade. He puts the taxes up enormously. So European traders now have to start looking for a cheaper way of getting spices and silks. They don't want to rely on an expansionist Islamic power. They don't want to pay the taxes. So they start looking for another way of getting to the Far East to get spices and silks. This starts off the phase in history we call the Age of Discovery. This is the period from the late 15th century going into the early 17th century. European explorers start a series of sea voyages. Uh, one of them, by accident, they find North America. And South America also is found by accident. So this is really quite a significant event in many ways, the capture of Constantinople. It was the capture of Constantinople that encouraged European traders and sailors to start looking for other routes to the Far East. But what made it possible was a revolution in shipbuilding technology. At the beginning of the 15th century, European ships outside of the Mediterranean were basically this type of ship, what we know as a cog. This is a modern replica uh, of a cog that was actually found in the port at Hamburg in Germany and it is very accurately dated and you can see it's a very small looking ship, it's got a single mast, uh, it's rather flat bottomed, it's not very good for sailing long distances. And European travellers, explorers very quickly found out when they sailed with a cog into the Atlantic Ocean down the coast of Africa, this isn't the best type of ship to use for that purpose. So, European explorers, shipbuilders, develop this, the caravel. The caravel is a bigger version of a cog. Two sails like this. This again, a replica based on an actual example, uh, photographed in the harbour of Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, this is the type of ship that was used by the Portuguese explorers in 1488. Uh, to sail around the tip of Africa, the beginnings of finding a way to get to the Far East. But again, there's a problem with a caravel. You see, in a heavy sea, the bow, the front part of the caravel, would go into the water. So they constantly risk being sunk in that way. The solution to this was the next stage, around about 1490, 1500, the introduction of what we know as the Karak. Again, a replica of a, a Karak, in this particular case, you can see it's in Japan at this particular moment. Uh, this is a copy of a Spanish Karak. The distinguishing feature is this. It has that high area at the front, a high area at the back. We call this a forecastle at the front, and a stern castle at the back. It makes the ship longer, you can have three masts, much better suited for sailing in open sea. But it's also very quickly realised that a Karak makes a very useful warship. You've got these raised areas at the front and the back. Sea warfare doesn't really exist up to this point, but it does happen on occasion. And a normal method of sea warfare was basically for one nation state to send its ships into the sea. Uh, the ships would be full of archers, bowmen. The idea would be that you would fire as many arrows as possible, kill as many enemy sailors or soldiers as possible, 
and then the ship would come alongside and then you would climb over onto the enemy's ship and kill any survivors and then capture their ship. So the warship, the development, the idea of a warship, again is something that comes from the capture of Constantinople, a rather roundabout route, but thanks to the introduction of the Karak. Well, the Karak, the Cog, and the um, Caravel were all built in the traditional European shipbuilding method, the clinker method. And we've already seen this in connection with the Southern Who ship. Uh, you have a series of boards or planks along the side of the ship, nailed to the side like that. But these create a lot of drag in the water. And sometime around about 1500 or so, European shipbuilders came across the idea of what we know as Carvel building. Carvel building is when the planks of wood are put right against each other, edge on edge. It allows a ship to go faster through the water. It allows you to build a bigger ship, a stronger ship. So this is a major development in, in many ways. Uh, it allows the development of warships, proper warships. What you see happening in the early years of the 16th century is the, the realisation that a Karak, a much stronger and larger type of ship, can carry more archers, it can carry more soldiers, but it can also carry cannon. So the warship is coming into development here. We now find ourselves in the year 1509. 1509, this man here, Henry VIII, becomes King of England. Henry VIII has inherited a navy from his father, who strangely enough was Henry VII, Yes, they do follow on logically to a certain extent. Most of you know of Henry VIII because, of course, his six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. But in many ways, what we have to give Henry VIII the credit for is not for marrying so many times and chopping the heads off occasionally, but for creating a modern navy. What Henry VIII realised was that you could convert a carrack into a warship but it still meant it was rather unsteady. It, the weight of the cannon on the Karak, let's just go back one side, on the waist deck, could mean that when the Karak is turning like this, there's always that possibility it might tip over. So what Henry VIII decided to do was to sit down and get his engineers to design a purpose-built warship, the first ever purpose-built warships. Work starts on building these, the first of these in 1509, a ship that was completed in 1511 when it was given the name Mary Rose. The Mary Rose was about 38, 39 metres long at the water level there. It was about four metres, uh, sat into the water by about four metres. Uh, it was 11 metres wide, twice as wide as a normal carrack. And the waist deck, where the guns were, was something like three metres above the waterline. It's much longer than a normal carrack. It's much heavier. It's carvel built. It's fast. Because it's longer, it's possible to put four masts on the ship. So she can carry ten sails, which makes her the fastest ship of her time, the flower of all ships. Well, the Mary Rose was the first of actually three or four purpose-built uh, warships. Uh, the second one that Henry built was the Henry Grace of Drew, Henry by the grace of God, uh, the ruler. It's slightly longer than the Mary Rose, built to the same basic design, but one very significant difference. Henry wants to up the fighting power of this ship. Instead of one row of cannon on the waist deck, it's got two rows of cannon, making this the most powerful ship of its time, although it was a rather unstable ship. It wasn't very good in very rough weather. Well, these ships were the most powerful ships of the time. They were provided, to start off with, with iron cannon like this. But iron cannon that were breech loaders, 
A breech loading iron cannon is basically an iron tube mounted on a wooden carriage with a couple of small wheels. You have a detachable part at the back, the breech. You put the cannonball in there. The cannonball weighs 10 kilo. You put the gunpowder in there. You put it in at the back of the cannon. You light it and get away very quickly before it all goes bang and the cannonball goes shooting off. Cannonballs made of stone, not iron. Why stone? Well, when stone hits something hard, it shatters into lots of pieces. An iron cannonball won't do that. If a stone cannonball breaks on impact when hitting something, lots of sharp pieces of stone going all through the ship, lots of people killed or cut down or wounded. The introduction of the Mary Rose and the Henry Grace to do, with their enormous number of cannon, their purpose-built ships, they're built, both built 11 metres wide. The idea being, of course, that when you fire all the cannons on one side, the ship won't tilt over too far. There's no possibility of it sinking. These two ships make it possible to fire a broadside. Instead of firing one cannon, then the next one, then the next one, because if you're worried that if you fire them all at the same time, the ship might tip over, all the cannons can be fired at the same time. Incredibly destructive power. These are the most advanced warships of their time. But the idea of fighting that existed in the medieval period um, with, with the, uh, uh, the cog ship and so forth, the idea that what you do is you capture an enemy ship is still very much the main uh, method of, of sea warfare. So what the Mary Rose has, like the Henry Grace to do, is not just cannons, but approximately 200 archers using the English longbow. The method of sea warfare is still very much like it was in, at the end of the 15th century, the beginning of the 16th century. Essentially, you have the cannons which can cause enormous damage to an enemy ship, but what you want to do is kill all the soldiers on board the enemy ship using the longbow, then go alongside and jump on board the next ship using daggers to kill as many enemies as possible. This is the type of dagger that was used in the 16th century for close combat fighting uh, in naval warfare. The Mary Rose turned out to be a very effective ship. She got a very large crew. Now, uh, on top of the ordinary seamen, uh, she got about 200 sailors, about 20 people to operate the cannons, about 200 archers as well. And the Mary Rose was very successful in two wars with France, uh, one in 1512, 1514, another 1522, 1525. In 1535, though, or by 1535, the French were beginning to copy the design of the Mary Rose. So what Henry VIII decided to do is to improve its fighting capability. He decides to put in an extra layer of guns on the Mary Rose. He puts them in at a lower level, below the waist step where the original guns were. It's realised, of course, that if you have guns at a lower level, just above the water line, there's always going to be a problem in rough sea. Water might come in and basically sink the ship. That's why you have these things called gun ports. Gun ports, a piece of the board that can be lifted to allow the cannons to be rolled out, pulled back down and sealed to make it watertight in case of rough weather. And so the Mary Rose is redesigned in 1535-1536. The original guns were all on what we call the waist deck at this level, but a series of seven guns are provided on each side at a lower level, about two and a half metres above the waterline. We're very fortunate in that we actually have, uh, not just from the Mary Rose itself, but detailed accounts of the time that tell us that the, these, uh, the new uh, redesigned Mary Rose is provided with 
bronze cannon in addition to the original iron cannon. Well, bronze cannon have got a, uh, certain advantages over an iron cannon. Uh, they can fire a heavy piece of metal much further. Now remember with the iron cannon, it fires stone cannonballs. The idea being that these will hit a ship, break into lots of fragments, kill or wound lots of the enemy. Bronze cannon fires an iron cannonball. The idea with this being that the iron cannonball will go right through an enemy ship and hopefully sink it. So you don't have to uh, risk this close combat fighting. The only problem is with the bronze cannons is they have to be muzzle loaded from the front. With the iron cannons, you take the breech out, put the shot in, the gunpowder, put it back, touch the blue paper, bang. As simple as that. But a bronze cannon has to be pulled back. The cannonball has to go in from the front, it has to be pushed into place. It's much slower to use than an iron cannon. So what we find with the redesigned Mary Rose is that she has got a combination of iron cannons and bronze cannon. This little drawing that was made uh, of the Mary Rose roughly at the time she was redesigned, 1535-1536. Uh, you can see the very high stern castle and the very high fore castle there. And you can, these would still be the main fighting platforms for archers. The original row of guns along the side there with extra guns put in a bit further back there, and these guns here just above the water line. At the end of the modifications, 1535-1536, the Mary Rose had about 15 bronze cannon and 24 iron cannon. She is the most powerful ship in the English Navy. And so it's only natural that she becomes what we call the flagship. The ship on which the Admiral of the English fleet sails when England and France are at war again in 1544. England and France are always fighting each other, or were always fighting each other until the 20th century, a whole series of wars. In 1544, the, the war with France, you don't need to worry about um, what this was all, all about, uh, but the French managed to actually trap the English Navy in this area here. The French then sent their fleet, their navy, into this area, which is known as the Solent. This area of water here is the Solent. What the French wanted to do was to land an army and capture the towns of Southampton and Portsmouth, the most important towns on the English coast and also the naval harbours at this particular time. Well, 1545 the English Navy has to deal with this threat to those two harbours. And so the English Navy set sail with Admiral Sir George Carew on board the Mary Rose to deal with the, the English Navy, roughly about 80 ships, to deal with an invasion navy of 120 ships. Sir George Carew knows he's got to do something here. He's really got to defeat the French on this particular day, not just because of the threat they are making, of possibly landing an army in England, but also he knows that Henry VIII is waiting and watching what's going on. So Sir George Caro leads his navy into action on July the 19th, 1545. He sails towards the French, fires his cannons, starts to make a turn, and suddenly the ship goes over like that. People watching from the land can see that the water is going in the open portholes at the lower level. The ship takes on so much water as it's turning that she starts to tilt over so steeply that within the ship, the cannons break loose, stores break loose, men fall from one side of the ship to the other. She becomes completely unstable and down she sank. Well, this was a major tragedy. Before the battle, before this actual uh, engagement, Sir George Carrow had taken on board the Mary Rose another 200 archers. So that the Mary Rose, at the time she sank, had something in the order of 700 people on board. 
Only 35 of them survived. Henry VIII is standing on South Sea Castle. He sees the ship sink. And this is a contemporary drawing of the ship actually sinking. And you can see just a few survivors swimming away there. As it was, the English Navy went on to defeat the French Navy that day. But this is the greatest sea disaster the English Navy has ever suffered in its entire history. Henry VIII wants the explanation. So why did it happen? Well, the general agreement was that basically the ship had probably turned too fast, possibly while firing its cannon, and that this had had the effect of making the ship heel over go over too far on one side like that, allowing the water to come in at the bottom there. The French, of course, claimed that they sank the ship with a cannonball. But this was the general conclusion that somehow, basically, the, the ship had sank while it was turning. Was it because of the extra men on board? Was it because the ship had just fired the cannon? Was it because the ship was unstable? Well, Henry VIII wanted to know what was going on, so he sent divers down to look at the wreck. The wreck was only just below the water level at this particular time, roughly 11 metres below the water surface. So it was easy to uh, swim down to it and try and recover cannon and things like that. Remember, this is the most efficient war machine that the English have at this particular time. I mean, they, a lot of money has been spent on it. So they try to work out a way of lifting it and getting the cannons out. But what they find is that basically the ship is on its side. It's impossible to refloat it. So the Mary Rose is basically left there, although a few of her contents were taken away. People then basically forgot about the Mary Rose until 1836. In 1836, some fishermen working in the Solent dragged their nets against a wreck. They sent a diver down to explore what it was. The diver came up with iron cannon on their preserved wooden carriages. The divers also found bronze cannon. Bronze cannon with the name of the ship, the Mary Rose, on it. Well, by this particular time, the Mary Rose has started to sink into the mud and it's 15 metres below the sea level. And nobody's really interested in looking at a shipwreck in the 19th century. So again, the story of the Mary Rose is forgotten until we get into the 1960s. 1965, a local underwater archaeologist, Alexander McKee, decided to start looking for the Mary Rose. He had no real idea where it might be, Roughly, the, the position was known, but no, not exactly. And so he didn't have much luck until 1967, when a wonderful device was developed, something called a side-scan sonar. Sonar stands for sound, navigation and raging. Actually, it's a way of actually telling distances by sending out sound waves. And it's a method that was used on warships in the Second World War to find out if there were any submarines beneath you. But in the 1960s, they developed a side scan sonar. It's a device that can be towed behind a ship and it sends out sound waves at an angle. And these bounce back and they will give you an impression of the level of the seabed below the ship. And this is what happened in 1967. Searching throughout the Solent, they eventually found a shadowy mark which clearly indicated a shipwreck of some kind. So Alexander McKee started diving down on this. He cleared away the wood from parts of the ship. He found pottery of the right date. He began to think this might actually be the Mary Rose. In 1971, a major storm cleared away a lot of the material from the shipwreck. He could see it was very much a wooden shipwreck. More importantly, he could see portholes. The portholes which the cannons had been let out of. McKee knew that this was the only ship, or the only ship, sunk in the Solent with portholes of a Tudor date, 
with the Mary Rose, so he knew he'd found it. This marked the beginning of an eight-year project, which saw the original team of 12 volunteer divers work in weekends, four months a year, eventually develop into a major team of 50 professional drivers, working 24 hours around the clock for nine months of a year to recover the site. The idea was to basically recover as much information about this ship as possible. It's the earliest, it's the first purpose-built warship. It's built right at that crucial period in the age of discovery, when shipbuilding techniques are being developed to allow sailors to sail a ship around the world. A very, very important find indeed. Well, surveys eventually showed that most of the shipwreck was all in one area, and that roughly one-third of it was still surviving. What had happened was that when the Mary Rose sank, she fell onto her side like this. The erosion process of waves and so forth gradually washed away all that part of the ship that, that was above uh, the sea bottom. But all the part of the ship that was on the sea bottom sank deeper and deeper into the mud. Water preserves wood. It keeps oxygen out, so anything that's in a heavy uh, water um, context, like a sunken shipwreck, a wooden shipwreck, if there are no nasty, horrible marine worms around, will actually survive in perfect condition. You can see this in a series of um, drawings taken uh, during the excavation. You have the original discovery over here of just one small part, bit by bit, this plan shows how the, the ship is beginning to appear. In 1976, they could see that they'd lost one entire side. But as they worked more and more down, they found the opposite side of the ship still preserved uh, in the sea bottom, complete with part of the front of the ship, the bow over there. Well, with one third of a Tudor warship surviving, obviously, the thing to do was to try and lift it. First, all the artefacts had to be taken out, and here we see one of the bronze cannon being lifted uh, from the side of the Mary Rose, so that eventually, the water is too dark to get a photograph, but eventually what was left on the sea bottom was just that one particular side of the ship there. These would have been the floors within the ship. You can see the actual bottom of the ship over on there. So it's decided to lift this one-third of a Tudor warship off the seabed in 1982. You can just see the preserve side, that's the actual bottom of the ship there. And she was taken into a store where she started to be sprayed with water, clean, fresh water, to replace the salt water that had preserved the wood. It's a long process to actually replace that salt water um, with fresh water to help preserve the wood. If you just let it dry, it will crack and it will disappear in no time at all. In 1995, when all the salt water had been taken out of the remains of the ship, it was possible to start treating uh, the ship remains with chemicals and now perfectly visible, next year it will go into a new museum so you will be able to see one side of the Mary Rose there. Meanwhile, other work continued on the site of the shipwreck. In 2007, the, the bow section of the ship, the very front part of the ship, was lifted, and also the ship's anchor. Well, these are all very remarkable finds, and this is what the Mary Rose looks like in the uh, museum. It says today, actually, that's what it looked like three years ago, because it's now been moved to, uh, in the process of being moved to a new museum. But you can see what a wonderful find it is. You've got the whole one side of a Tudor warship, a unique find, the first ever purpose-built warship, complete with the floor timbers and things like that. We're missing one side of it, that's true. But in many ways, that's an advantage because we can actually see inside the ship a lot better. Well, as you might expect, with a ship that sank so quickly, so quickly that out of seven or eight hundred people, only 35 survived. A lot of things went down with that ship. 
All in all, during the eight years of the excavation, they found something like uh, 22,000 objects, separate objects. Some of these are the type of objects you would associate with a warship. The ship's bell for ringing the hours on, on the ship. Do you know how ship life works? Anybody been in the Navy? Ah, right. Well, it's not done by time. It's done by eight bells. Ding, 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 ding. That's wake-up time, okay? Everything's done by the bell, even in the modern Navy. So a ship's bell is a characteristic part of any ship, warship or modern ship. Of course, there were all the wonderful cannon, and the bronze cannons and the iron cannon, the state-of-the-art weaponry from the Tudor period, the time of Henry VIII. Some of these with the symbol of Henry VIII written on them, the Tudor rose design, uh, like this. It's a red and a white rose there. Over 300 preserved longbows. Remember, the Mary Rose is the fighting ship. She uses her cannon when going into battle, but for close combat, it's bow and arrow fighting. No handguns really in use at this time. And within the Mary Rose, 300 preserved English longbows like this. So well preserved that it was possible to actually stretch one. Not bad for something that went underwater in 1495, 1545, beg your pardon. Unfortunately, although water will preserve wood and organic materials very well, it doesn't preserve iron that well. So there are lots of wooden handles like this that belong to these bollock daggers, but only one particular blade survived. That was found underneath the ship. That's how it actually survived there. There was also just a single officer's sword that may have belonged to Sir, Sir George Caro. We honestly don't know about that. The really exciting thing, though, is that, you know, weapons you can find you know, on land sites and things like that. But because of the preservative qualities of the ship being sunk in seawater, things survive that don't survive on land. All sorts of items from the Tudor period, from the day the ship sank which we have no other evidence for. This, for example, is a sleeveless jerkin. It's basically a one-piece uh, uh, garment that a sailor would wear over his body like that, split at the front and the back to allow it to be fastened together. Uh, the neck goes through that little uh, hole there. Preserved wood leather shoes. And I think they're rather nice, attractive design, actually. They look like slippers, but these are Tudor shoes. Well, ships have to sail in stormy weather. Sea boots that come right up to the legs. And the more intimate items. These are knit combs. Knits are these horrible little insects that you get in your hair if you don't wash your hair and you don't live in very clean, hygienic condition. A knit comb is designed to comb the knits out. So many knit combs were found on the Mary Rose that obviously the sailors had a major problem with them. And these are the actual Tudor knits preserved in one of these knit combs. Surprising aspects about social life as well were revealed thanks to the excavation of the Mary Rose. Henry VIII, best known for having had six wives. How does he manage to get six wives? He's a good Catholic, you're only supposed to marry once, you're not supposed to get divorced. Well, basically in 1534, um, he has an argument with the Roman Catholic Pope. He sets up his own church, the Church of England, which is still alive today. Roman Catholics are not allowed to practice their religion in England. On the Mary Rose, several of these were found. These are called rosaries. They're prayer beads, just like a tespa, the same type of thing. But these are used by Catholics to count their prayers. So we have this clear evidence that the Mary Rose has got a large number of Catholics on board, even though the Catholic religion has technically been banned. Well, people on a ship need a bit of entertainment, don't they? 
a fiddle and a bow. Basically a violin type of instrument. Tabor, drums. These sailors kept themselves really quite happy in many ways. Then you have these other items when you get really bored. A backgammon board, chess boards, all these sort of things. This wonderful insight into daily life on board a Tudor ship. Leather water buckets. Clean water was always a problem. Not just at sea, but on land as well. And so it's no surprise to what we find on board the ship, in addition to wooden bowls and wooden spoons, the remains of beer barrels. In fact, there was something like uh, 22 beer barrels found on board the Mary Rose. This is very important archaeological proof for something that we only knew about from documents of the period. An English document of 1565, 20 years after the Mary Rose sank, says that every sailor on board a ship should have, free of charge, the equivalent of 35 litres of beer every week. That's how many litres a day? Rather a lot of beer, isn't it? Well, the point is that what you have to bear in mind here is that to keep water fresh is very difficult on board a ship or anywhere. Boiling water is one way of killing off the germs in the water. But it was realised very early on, the Egyptians realised this, that if you make beer, you can make a liquid, it doesn't have to be too alcoholic, that is safe to drink, you can store it. So, like beer, not too alcoholic. Tudor beer, drunk out of tankards like this, was probably about as alcoholic as many American beers. So about 2%, 2.5%, something like that. Not like Effie's. I mean, come on, you can't go around drinking 35 litres of Effie's a week and still function on board a ship. You'd fall off at some point. So we have all these wonderful bits and pieces of information about daily life, the different wine jars, uh, evidence of trade. I mean, different types of pottery. This is English, but these are German uh, wine jars there cooking pots, animal bones that tell you what the sailors were eating, carpenter's tools. Now remember, iron doesn't survive very well underwater, so you're missing the iron blade of that. You're missing the iron drill of that. But the carpenter's tools for repairing the ship, bits of the ship's equipment, pulley blocks for helping you raise the sails, a wonderful piece of information there. Some very extraordinary finds. This is part of a compass style, the sort of thing that tells you where north is and where south is and so forth. This is a pocket sundial and these are dividers. Well, there is no evidence in the literature of a compass being used on a ship in the Tudor period. Our evidence comes in the form of a find from the Mary Rose. Dividers are used for measuring distances on charts. A chart is a, a sea map. There is no evidence that charts existed before the 17th century, but clearly they must have existed on board the Mary Rose, otherwise you wouldn't have the dividers. The most horrible find in some points of view was the barber surgeon's chest. Barber surgeons, these were the guys who cut your hair and they also dealt with you if you were ill. The barber surgeon's chest contained his hat, a symbol of his office as a doctor, a little lantern with a candle so you can go around the ship, the dark interior of the ship to look for patients, and all of his instruments. Well, the iron had all gone, but this is a replica of uh, the type of instruments that were found in the uh, barber, uh, sur barber surgeon's chest. Uh, and I saw a vein of sharp knife. Well, if you've got to cut somebody's arm off, first of all, you have to use the sharp knife to open up the flesh. And then it goes zzzz, like that. That's what these were used for. This is, in many ways, one of the nastiest things. 
A urethral syringe, a medicine for the treatment of the Spanish or French disease, gonorrhea, venereal disease. This is the actual medicine, and that's the syringe. This is not something with a needle on the end that you stick in the skin. It's something you stick at part of your body. Ouch. It's the normal response to that particular one. A couple homely touches, though. The ship's dog. Found the skeleton of the ship's dog and things like that as well. Well, the mystery of why the ship sank is still very much a mystery. But some very interesting things were found out from the bodies of the people who had sunk with the ship. The bodies of 179 people were found uh, in the Mary Rose. And many of them, the skeletons, were just found in bunches grouped together. What had clearly happened was as the ship started to sink, people made a run for the door. You've got 20, 25 people trying to get through one door. They can't get out. They sank with the ship. A large number of them were clearly archers. If you do full-time archery, you develop certain muscles in the arm which need attachments to the bone, and you can see these attachments. And it can be seen that the majority of the uh, people who died on the Mary Rose were, in fact, archers. How did it ship? Well, we still really don't quite know how the ship sunk. The evidence seems to suggest, though, that when the Mary Rose was modified in 1535, by putting in this extra layer of guns down here, it increased the weight, almost doubled the weight of the ship, from about 300, 400 tons to uh, about five or 700 tons. The big mistake was to put the guns in at a lower level, only two and a half meters above the waterline. You would have had something like this. Very heavy, rather unstable ship, sailing into action, firing her guns. Not all of her guns were fired, because when she was excavated, some of the guns still had the cannon charge in them. But then when she tried to turn round, possibly a gust of wind, possibly too unstable. Remember, there are seven or 800 people on board a ship that's designed to carry 400. The weight of the extra guns probably made her totally unstable. She probably sank by accident. Strangely enough, we can actually reconstruct the face of the man who sank the Mary Rose. This particular skull, here being uh, built up for facial reconstruction, was found on the lower level of the ship. Around the neck of this skeleton was a special type of whistle called a bosun's pipe. A bosun's pipe is used for giving messages. It's, it is a whistle, basically. Well, a bosun is the man who's responsible for making a ship as watertight. The bosun is the man who's responsible on the Mary Rose for making certain the gun ports were closed when the ship tried to turn too quickly. So, here you have the man who sunk the Mary Rose. There we are. We'll stop at that point. Have I gone over time? Have I gone under time? Oh, look at that. Three minutes to go. Song and dance act? No? Okay then. Three minutes to go and then we come back.